Hi, and thank you for joining me. Today's workshop is going to talk about communicating research impact. I'm Erin Owens. I'm a professor in the Newton Gresham Library at Sam Houston State University. And as the scholarly communications librarian, I assist researchers at all levels, from undergraduate to graduate and faculty and staff, with topics related to the conduct and dissemination of research. So getting started today, the slides will be available online with this recording. So please don't worry if you're not able to write things down, you will be able to reference back to the links. Now, before I actually start talking about how we communicate research impact, I think it's important to take a step back and ask, first of all, why are we worrying about impact? It is entirely valid to say that we can conduct inquiry simply for inquiry's sake, just to build our own knowledge. That's valid, even if that work never has any impact on anyone else. Nevertheless, the reality of the world we live in right now is that sometimes being able to communicate the impact of our research is important to help us secure funding for future research, to help us form research partnerships, maybe to help us build a case for tenure and promotion, or to achieve other types of goals. So what do we actually mean when we say impact? I think this is another important point to address before we really dive into the details. In general, we can say that impact is the effect research has beyond academia. That's one definition. Um, we can say when the knowledge that is generated by our research contributes to benefits and influences society, culture, our environment, and the economy. The key point here is that the impact itself is something that other people or institutions gain or do. It's not something that we as researchers can really do on our own. We can't force our work to have impact. Now there's also the academic impact side of it. We can talk about the contribution that research makes in shifting the understanding in a field, advancing the scientific method, theory, application, things like that. That's one type of impact. So that's not so much beyond academia as it is maybe the influence that a work has within academia. And we can think of that as the other side of the coin to the economic and societal impact that shows how our work is benefiting, benefiting individuals, organizations, or nations. Areas of research impact might include things like our academic, scholarly, intellectual impact, cultural impact, economic, environmental, social, an impact on human health and well-being, policy influence and policy change, uh, changes in practice for fields such as teaching, legal impact, uh, technological developments as well. I like this graphic from CSIRO illustrating the impact framework. So we start at the beginning with inputs. This is whatever we are able to put into our research. So money, staff, equipment, time, all of those things are the impacts. We have a lot of direct control over what input we can plan. Then come the activities. What do we actually do with all of that money and staff and equipment? That's actually conducting the research itself. Again, we have a fair amount of control over being able to plan and implement that stage. After we do the stuff, we create outputs. You can think of these as your conference presentations, your journal articles, your books, any sort of output that communicates your findings out to a broader audience. This is also a piece that we can plan to a pretty good extent. Um, we can make decisions about what conferences we're going to submit to, what journals we're going to submit to. We can't always guarantee that those um, outputs will be accepted at the venues that we send them to, but we at least have control over publishing a white paper or a preprint openly on the web. So we do have a fair amount of control over um, those outputs. After we get past the output stage, we get to actual outcomes. This is where a person, an individual or an organization, reads the work, and implements some kind of a change. A teacher decides to teach differently. A nurse decides to triage patients differently. So this is someone making a decision to behave differently 
based on the findings that were communicated in our outputs. We can have some amount of direct influence over that to the extent that we can go out and talk to people, we can give our justifications for why we think these changes would be good. So we can have a little bit of direct influence there, but we don't really have control over that step. We can talk to people all we want till we're blue in the face, but whether or not they actually implement a change is going to be out of our control. Now, it's when we get one step beyond those outcomes that we get to actual impact. This is where we actually see the effect that those changes, those outcomes made on society, the environment, the economy, the academy, whatever that is. We have only somewhat indirect influence on that. We really have very little control over that impact. So I like the way that this diagram illustrates the, um, the stages which can be planned, um, the stages which can be controlled, that level of which we have decreasing influence as we go forward. I like that they've incorporated that. The other piece I really want you to take out of this visual is the feedback loops at every stage. At every stage of our activities, we are taking feedback from what's happening and feeding that back into our research process. So when we see what sorts of outcomes did, um, did our work have, that may inform what our next project looks like. What inputs do we contribute to our next project to help it be successful? What outputs do we plan to create to help that information be communicated. So there's these feedback loops that are really operating in every piece of this process. And we wanna always keep that at the forefront of our mind that we don't want every project to just be, hey, I'm going from point A to point B in exactly the same way that I've always known how to do it. And I'm not taking stock of whether or not it's being successful. We wanna really be taking stock of that context around us and letting that inform our future processes. So and when we think about wanting to try to achieve impact, some of the things we need to do at the very start of a project, we want to ask, what can I do to ensure that the potential beneficiaries of my work will actually have the opportunity to engage with it? So if I'm going to publish my work, am I publishing it in a venue where it's going to be seen by the people who need it? We want to be specific first about who those possible beneficiaries are, you need to know who am I speaking to with this work? Am I speaking to practicing educators in a high school classroom? Am I speaking to university professors who teach in a college of education to prepare high school teachers? Am I speaking to high school students? Am I speaking to politicians who make policy about the K-12 educational environment? A piece of work that's done in the field of education could be speaking to any of those audiences, but the way that we will communicate it to ensure that they can engage with it will be very different. So we have to actually know who we're trying to reach. Then we need to make sure that whatever methods we choose for getting our information out there are appropriate to that audience. Do I assume that my practicing teacher in the high school classroom is going to have access to very expensive scholarly journals, which may be commonplace on a university campus, but likely aren't being provided in that K-12 environment and likely aren't within the budget of that teacher to purchase on their own. We wanna think upfront about how we might gather evidence of outcomes and impact. It's really very, very hard to collect and measure things if you haven't even thought about what you want to collect and measure. And you, I'm sure you all understand that as researchers, right? Because that's the same process we go through at the beginning of a research project. We say, this is the question I want to answer. What kind of evidence would I need to collect to answer that question? We wanna ask that same question here about the end point of our research. What sort of evidence would I look for to indicate that my work made a difference somewhere, that it changed something and hopefully changed it for the better, right? 
So we want to put some good brainstorming into that from the beginning about in an ideal perfect world, what uh, what track would we expect to see? What little breadcrumb trail would we see from our work to some kind of potential impact? All right, so let's talk about some different ways that we can attempt to influence impact. Again, remembering that we only have some indirect amount of control over this or indirect influence over this. What are some steps we can take? <clears throat> the first step is to think about how we publicize our outputs. How do you get the word out? Now, when we're affiliated with an institution like SHSU, we can try and leverage the Marketing and Communications Office. They cover research on the SHSU website, on social media channels. So maybe we reach out to them and say, hey, I'm doing this cool research project. Would you like to profile it on the website? We can, of course, promote our work through our professional networks. So whatever scholarly societies we belong to, we send messages out to those um, discussion boards, those email lists. We post things on social media related to our scholarly networks and communities. We may also want to disseminate things to relevant media outlets. So this might be news websites, print newspapers or magazines, um, television stations, and tell them about the work that we're doing. This may not be enough to just say, look, I published this article. That's not the piece that's going to interest those media outlets. What you're going to do is tell them the meat of what that article communicates. I found this discovery, this information, this insight, and get them interested in helping you to communicate that out to a broader audience. As part of that, you can talk to the Marketing and Communications Office at the university about the possibility of writing a press release, which could then be a standard piece of communication to distribute to those media outlets. You can obviously disseminate your work directly to the people that you think are the likely beneficiaries. If you've already put a lot of thought into who your audience is, now you think about, okay, where is that audience? What physical and virtual spaces are they already occupying? And how could I get information about my work into their spaces so that they can discover it directly. Now, this is one I think a lot of us don't necessarily think about. We can submit less academic summaries of our work to blogs in our field. Um, this can be a great way to make the findings of your work more understandable to laymen, particularly if your audience is not other academics being able to break it down into less academic language and really get the point across more easily, um, especially in shorter format blogs where maybe that audience member is much more likely to just read a short blog post than they are to go read a full 15 page scholarly article. Also the additional benefit of getting that into blog spaces is that virtual content indexing that starts pulling that into Google search engines and things so that it is more discoverable for someone to find that less formal summary, that informal overview. And then if they are really interested, they can follow the link from that blog post to the complete publication for more depth. We can post citations and abstracts of our work on scholarly profiling services. And by this, I mean websites you've probably heard of like academia.edu, ResearchGate, um, making sure that we have a Google Scholar profile that reflects our citations and maintaining our ORCID ID that compiles all of our work as a unique researcher, regardless of our name or affiliation. So keeping those kinds of things up to date is another way to get that information out into that virtual content indexing, where things will be picked up by search engines and be discovered by people who are searching for a topic related to your work. And finally, we can think about sharing open access versions of our work, of our articles and things, with the caveat that we do so within the boundaries permitted by the publisher. So depending on where you've published and what sort of a publication agreement you have signed, you may or may not have permission to share the final PDF from the journal, the actual like 
polished, flashy, shiny, formatted document, or your author accepted manuscript, which is basically the last Word document you sent to the editor after all of your revisions were completed, or the author submitted format uh, manuscript, which would be the Word document you submitted at the beginning before any kind of peer review and revisions. So that's kind of the three main versions of our file that we think about is that final published version, the author accepted and the author's submission. And different publishers are gonna have different rules about which of those you can share and when and on what kinds of websites. So we do wanna be careful that we understand those rules before we go sharing copies of our files openly. If you aren't sure what was permitted by your publishing agreement, this is an area where the library can be of assistance to help you sort out what you're allowed to do. All right, some other ways of achieving impact would involve commercializing outputs from your work. This would be things like patenting, licensing, and we do have an office um, at SHSU that will help our researchers with these kinds of processes. So our uh, technology and commercialization unit in the Office of Research and Sponsored Programs. I'm not gonna go into any more depth in this talk about the commercialization aspect. We're gonna focus more on other types of uh, publicizing. Okay, so some other factors that can help to support the, um, the building of impact. We wanna think about establishing networks of our research users. So again, this is thinking about the audience, thinking about who we're trying to communicate to, who we're trying to help, what we're trying to achieve for them, we want to be sure that all of our research processes are being done with them, not just for them, in communication with them. So one of the steps we can do is to really establish those networks, build those relationships, make sure they know that you acknowledge and respect their expertise, their lived experience, and their role in making impact from your work happen. That, you know, if you've written this work for them, but they don't engage with it, then your work goes nowhere and is meaningless. So we have to acknowledge their role in being the ones that make that happen. Similarly, we wanna make sure that they're involved at all stages of the research. Um, user stakeholder groups, making sure we understand, again, that we're doing things in communication with these people in the proper ways. If you're not doing research with human subjects, some of this may not apply in those cases, of course. We wanna make sure that we have a solid understanding of the policy and practice context that we're working in. And this can apply regardless of whether you're working with human subjects. Um, make sure you understand the landscape. What are the various laws and policies that relate to the subject matter I'm working with? What are the practical application contexts? Um, and how do those things influence what I'm doing in my work? Because if I can work with those appropriately, if I work completely blind to those, my work may come out way over here and not be useful. And this one's kind of going back to the, the, um, the idea of either the human subjects of our work or else simply the audience that we would like to consume our outputs at the end. We wanna make sure we're committed to creating portfolios of research activity that build up a strong reputation with the users of our research. We want them to trust us as researchers, to believe that we have their best interests in place when we're doing our work, to believe that they are our intended beneficiaries. So the more that we show that all of our activity is building on itself and building more and more towards their benefit, the more we get that reputation and that trust. And then the more that they will look for our work when it comes and they will use their own platforms to amplify our work out to others. And so that's this last bullet involving intermediaries as translators, amplifiers, and network providers. Okay, so now I wanna shift into talking about indicators of impact. So this is kind of asking about that evidence piece. What evidence are we looking for that might suggest that we've had an impact? So we're gonna talk largely about research metrics. Research metrics are measures used to quantify 
the influence or impact of scholarly work. Research metrics are used because of a desire for a quantifiable objective means of comparing scholarship. However, they all have weaknesses. Okay, that's that's the thing we want to understand up front. We go seeking these quantitative metrics because we are hoping for something objective and measurable, but we are rarely getting the full benefit of what, what our ideal would be. The criticism of most research metrics often centers on um, the limitations to database coverage um, that is used to create these metrics. So let me give you an example. You've possibly heard of the impact factor. This is a particular research metric. It's a ratio based on how many citations a journal's content receives. So it is a metric of the journal itself, not a particular article. You take the number of articles that the journal has published over a period of years, usually two years, but you can also get a five-year metric, the number of articles they've published that could be cited, and then the number of citations that they receive. And that ratio gives you an impact factor. Now, the impact factor itself is a proprietary measure owned by Clarivate and used in the Web of Science database. So the articles, it's the, the journals, I'm sorry, the journals that it is looking at to assign those impact factors and the citations it is counting to calculate those impact factors are entirely based on the Web of Science database. It is only looking at content in that box. If there are journals that aren't indexed in there, they're not gonna have impact factors. If there are citations to journals, but the citations come from places that aren't in Web of Science, then those citations aren't being counted. So this is what I mean by the limitation of the coverage of the databases, is that you're not really getting a comprehensive measure when it is limited to the scope of one database. And I'm not picking only on impact factor. There are a lot of other metrics that suffer from very similar problems. Another criticism is the failure to account for differences in scholarly output and citation rates among disciplines. What do I mean by this? By this, I mean that if you're working in some kinds of technology and health fields, research might move very, very quickly. You might be putting out a lot of papers. Papers might get cited very, very fast. If we think of some of the disciplines where it's very common to publish pre-print articles on the web before an article actually gets into a peer-reviewed journal, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about here because the speed is so essential in those fields. So we expect to see these high rates of output and these very quick returns of citations. Let's contrast that to other fields in the humanities, maybe English literature, history, fields like this. The outputs, they do publish journal articles, but also books are very, very common. One researcher spending a lot of time writing one long in-depth work. So the rate of output is probably going to be much slower than we'd see in other fields, but that's appropriate to the kind of work that discipline wants to see. The citation rates as well are much, much slower. A book might be out for quite a number of years before it really starts to accrue much in the way of citations. And that's normal within that discipline. But if we try to compare two articles or two researchers from those vastly different disciplines, it isn't fair to say that this biomedical researcher is better than this historian because, just because their output rate and citation rate are different. It's comparing apples to oranges. They have different expectations. So we have to be careful when we use research metrics to make sure that we're not comparing apples to oranges. And then finally, the other criticism here, the other main criticism is that the use of research metrics really does represent an over-reliance on quantitative measures where we probably ought to put more effort into qualitative assessment to actually reading scholarship, thinking critically about the questions asked and the methods applied and the conclusions reached and asking whether that represents rigorous, high quality scholarship. That's hard to do. It takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. People are much more likely to fall back on the simplicity of these numerical measures, but over-relying on them really 
really is sort of a weakness. Okay, so with that in mind, let's talk about some traditional impact metrics. And I do want to clarify here that if you remember that visual earlier of the um, input, activity, output, outcomes, and uh, impact diagram, in many cases, we it's really, really, really hard to measure the actual impact bubble at the end of that diagram, the actual social or environmental change that is affected by the outcomes. That's really, really hard to capture. And usually that's very long-term kinds of things. So really when we talk about impact metrics and gathering this evidence, it's usually more evidence of the outcomes. It's really more evidence of somebody read this, somebody used it, somebody applied this knowledge. That's really more the level that we're capturing things at. And I do think that's important to, um, to clarify. But that being said, some traditional impact metrics that are used, um, journal level metrics. So again, this is something like the impact factor or other similar metrics that are based on how often a journal is cited. Um, other things we look at about a journal might be the acceptance rate. How many submissions do they receive in a year? And out of those, how many actually get accepted and published? We might look at the longevity of a journal. This journal in chemistry has published for 120 years. This one has published for two. It doesn't actually mean that one is better than the other, but it's information about those journals. New journals are not necessarily bad. We do not want to reach that conclusion. But journals that have sustained themselves for a long time, that continue to be published and to be profitable and sustainable, they do sort of acquire a sense of um, reputation, a sense of trust. And that feeds into this last bullet of perceived prestige. There are often journals in, in within a field that have this aura uh, of prestige and reputation that everybody knows that that's one of the great journals, possibly not by any objective measures, but simply by the shared understanding within that research community. So here is a screenshot illustrating um, JAMA. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is a snippet from um, the information that displays for it when you search in Google. And you'll see here that it shows their impact factor that is 157.3 as of the 2021 data from Clarivate uh, and Web of Science. It also shows us here that this journal has been published from 1883 to present, which again feeds into that longevity metric and that sense of kind of trust. Some other traditional metrics that we look at at the item level. Um, or the researcher level. I've sort of mixed them together here. Um, so we can look at the number of articles published. So thinking about the researcher, how much do they publish? Again, it doesn't exactly mean that one person's better than another if they publish more. Sometimes we can achieve quantity um, by sacrificing quality, right? So we want to always keep that in context. They've published a lot. Is it all equally good? Um, we can look at the number of citations to a work. So you published this article, it's been cited 3,000 times. That means that a lot of people have read and engaged with it. Um, we will talk more about citations in a moment, though. Also, then, um, how many patents a researcher has filed or, or had granted, and what kind of commercial profit a work has had are some other metrics you might look at there. Uh, here is a screen capture from the Web of Science database showing that this article had 161 citations and it's got a little fire icon beside it showing that it's what they consider a hot paper because the citations have been coming in fairly rapidly since the time of publication. So these are just sort of some examples of where you see some of these traditional metrics coming into play. And then another one that exists at the researcher level is the H index. You've probably seen this if you look at the Google Scholar profiles, researcher profiles. Um, and an H index has to do with looking at how many works you've published, how often they've been cited, and finding a balance line where you've published at least X works, you've published X number of works that have at least X number of citations. 
this helps to adjust a little bit for the fact that maybe you have one paper which got an uncharacteristically high number of citations, but most of your other papers have only low citations. It allows you to balance out those outliers, okay? So that you can say, well, yeah, you have one paper with 3,000 citations, but for the most part, your papers have five citations. So you've got 20 papers with, um, so you've got, I'm sorry, you've got five papers with five citations would give you an H index of five. There are several alternatives to the H index that have been proposed, things like the G index and the E index, and they all have their own similar issues. Okay, so let's dig into citations a little bit more. I told you we would talk about citations more. This is really critical. So I want you to ask yourself this question as you're watching this recording. Pause it, take a minute to think. What does it mean when a work is cited? What does that mean? Well, there's many, many different reasons for citing. We could be citing things because we referenced their methodology, developing our own methodology. We could be referencing them just as foundational background on a topic. We could also be citing them to say that our work has revealed multiple flaws in their conduct of research or that we've disproven their findings. So a citation can be positive, can be really supporting and, and validating a work, but it can also be really de, um, disparaging of a work. And then sometimes it can just be totally neutral. Maybe I didn't really say much of substance about your work. I just cited it in passing to make my literature review look more comprehensive. Maybe I only cited your work because you're my research advisor and I wanted to get brownie points with you by citing your work. There are so many possible reasons for citing and there are so many possible biases. That's why I included that example of citing your advisor's work just for brownie points. There can be a lot of biases for why we cite. There can also be a lot of biases in who gets cited. Um, in many cases, we see that when you have multiple works out there in an area around a topic, the work by the white male Western researchers is likely to end up getting more citations than the works by other kinds of underrepresented scholars, regardless of maybe who had the first work or the most foundational work. Um, those citations are often not equitably distributed. So we need to ask ourselves, if we don't know what citations mean, then what does it mean when we count them? Could mean very little, right? If we don't even know why you cited it, then what does the number really tell us? Um, and then I really want to share this quote in full because I think this is incredibly important that citations are not the end all be all representation of whether your work is worthwhile. A lot of research may in fact labor in obscurity, but that doesn't mean that at some point it won't become of signal importance. Maybe you're before your time and your work is gonna become critical later. Basic research takes time to germinate as, as Karen Wolf says here. Um, and then ultimately some works won't have any measurable impact at all. But that does not mean that it is low quality work. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. And I think this, this is so important for us as researchers. And particularly if we find ourselves in roles where we um, have the power to evaluate other researchers, let us question this paradigm that that number of citations is not a proxy for the worth of that researcher's work. So I've talked a little bit about some of the problems with some of these traditional metrics. Those journal level impact factors and things are very limited by the database they use. Um, citations are useful on some level, but problematic. So let's talk about some alternative kinds of metrics that we can leverage, or alt metrics for short. These generally demonstrate engagement at the item level. So like the individual article, say. Now these can include some things that involve citations in a different way. So for example, field-weighted citation count. 
This is going to take the number of citations to a specific work and place it in relation to the average citation activity within that field. So this helps us with that biomedicine versus history problem. Let's just focus on articles in the same area and compare how they performed in citation relative to their average. It's still a little problematic as a citation count, but it's a little better than just a raw count. We can look at digital usage of a work. Most of these articles now are hosted online with their publisher, and we can usually get data about how many times the article has been viewed or downloaded. It helps us to see people engaging with it. It does share some of the similar problems with citations that we don't necessarily know why they're engaging with it, but it does at least show interest. We can look at things like social media, um, how many times an article was posted, was liked, et cetera. That may be more meaningful or much less meaningful depending on your feel. You really kind of have to know the behavior in your discipline as to whether social media sharing is or is not a critical way that researchers are communicating with each other. Um, Mendeley readers. So Mendeley is a particular reference manager software where you can collect citations and full text papers and organize them and compile them um, as you're working on your research. There is aggregate data available from Mendeley. I say aggregate in the sense that I cannot go look at John Doe Jr. and tell you what is in his library, but there's aggregated data about which works are in Mendeley libraries. So this is another, another indicator of engagement of some sort. People have at least, you know, bookmarked my article in their library. It suggests that maybe they will cite it someday. Again, it doesn't tell the whole story by itself, but it, it, it's one component we could look at. We can look at syllabus adoption. Hard to be comprehensive here because lots of people don't share their syllabi, but there are some places online like the Open Syllabus Project that we can search across shared syllabi and see whether our book or article has been assigned as required reading in a course. That would certainly be an indicator of some kind of outcome that that instructor of that course found our work meaningful enough that they wanna require their students to engage with it. Just a moment. All right. Um, for book publications in particular, we can look at book holdings in WorldCat libraries. WorldCat's a database that's like a combined library catalog for hundreds of thousands of libraries around the world. So being able to show that X number of academic institutions say, have found your book to be important enough to add to their collections, that kind of information again can show a certain, a certain type of engagement. And then as I mentioned earlier, there are some researcher level alternatives to the H index. Um, they're each different. They each improve upon some of the weaknesses of H index, which, which I forgot to detail for you a moment ago. The main problems with the H index, um, as you calculate, you know, you have this number of publications with at least this number of citations, that number can never go down. It is one of the few um, metrics of performance in this area that can only stay the same or go up. But even if you stop publishing for the next 20 years, whatever H index you have right now can never decrease. That's a little weird. Um, the other problem with H indexes is that they favor late career researchers over early career researchers. So the longer you have been working in your field, the longer you've been publishing, the longer you've been accumulating citations, the higher your H index is likely to go. So I can't compare this full professor who's been in his field for 30 years and this new professor who's in his first year. That's again, apples and oranges. You cannot compare across um, ranks and, and years of experience in these things. And you really, really cannot compare against fields. So um, H index has this very limited usefulness that maybe I can compare you to another researcher in your exact field with a similar number of years of experience, but it's a pretty narrow application. So some of these alternatives correct for some of those weaknesses, but they all kind of still have their own weaknesses. 
All right, here's a quick snapshot showing you some of these metrics. Uh, this is pulled from a database called dimensions.ai. You can create a free account in it, search for an article, um, and then see these kinds of numbers that show you, you know, this article I snapped was uh, mentioned in 752 news sources. It's been cited in five policy documents. Uh, it's been cited in 101 Wikipedia articles, et cetera. So this kind of shows you some of that myriad of different kinds of engagement. Uh, you can also see the field citation ratio and relative citation ratio. RCR is basically the same as field citation ratio, but um, is only applied in health-related fields in uh, basically articles that are in PubMed. Okay, some other indicators. And these are less specific, less, less precisely quantitative and, and a little bit broader and more anecdotal, but informative. So we can think about the sources of our citations, not just the number of them, not just how many, but who, who and why. So uh, geography, am I only being cited by other researchers in the US and the UK? with this you know, Western dominated world of research? Am I being cited by researchers in other parts of the world? What is the geography of my research topic? And am I being cited by people who are actually associated with the geography that I'm talking about? Those kinds of things can matter. Uh, what languages, how many languages am I being cited in? Am I making it past kind of my own identity barriers to reach other diverse kinds of readers? Um, is my work primarily being cited by experts, by other scholars in my field? Is it being cited by graduate students and theses and dissertations? This is not to say that any of these combination of things is better or worse. It's going to depend on your work. But this type of anecdotal information can help you to tell the story about what you want your work to accomplish and what you can see that it does seem to be accomplishing. Um, we can think about the openness of your outputs. So based on where we've published and where we have shared copies of our files with publisher, within publisher permissions, um, how open is our work? What kind of access do people have to it beyond just the ivory tower? People that are not in a university with a multi-million dollar budget for journal subscriptions. That may matter more or less, depending on who your intended audience is, who your intended beneficiaries are. But if your intended beneficiaries are not people in that ivory tower, and that's the only place that your work is accessible, then there's a real disconnect there. So being able to show that my outputs are at an appropriate level of openness to be broadly accessible to the people who could benefit from them. Uh, discussing more anecdotally, the influence that your work has had on teaching, practice, and policy. Some of this may be through policy citations, but some of this may just be through discussions with beneficiaries. This may involve um, someone within that network of experts, that network of stakeholders that you've established, someone reaching out to you and saying, hey, thank you for your excellent work on blah, blah, blah. I have incorporated that into my practice like this. Uh, we might think about the ways in which our work aligns with something like the sustainable development goals from the UN or with other types of roadmaps. Maybe your discipline has established research priorities, priority areas that need to be addressed in the field. Being able to show that your work is supporting goals and priorities that have been established within your lane uh, can be important. Uh, we could talk about the number and types of research collaborations we've been able to develop. And then, of course, we can talk about things like awards, honors, appointments to places like the National Academies, and other sorts of distinctions that our work or simply us as a researcher have earned. Now, a lot of the indicators that I've talked about have really focused on um, article type publications and in more of the science and social science fields. So I do want to take a moment to mention creative fields. They're not left out of this picture. Um, this snapshot just shows a few suggested things, but the link here to this guide from the University of Melbourne is absolutely excellent. I just linked to them because I'm, I can't even try to recreate what they've already done. They have proposed quite a few ideas of indicators of impact for um, those people who are working in creative and fine art 
types of fields, thinking about engagement in other ways like performances, exhibitions, and beyond. So I'm not going to go into much depth on that, but I do really want to share that University of Melbourne research guide uh, as a resource if you're interested in digging more into how you can indicate impact in the creative fields. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we can identify potential metrics. Like there's a ton of this stuff out there. How do I know what's appropriate for me to use? I'm gonna highlight a couple of key resources here. The Metrics Toolkit, Snowball Metrics, and the Becker, library, uh, Becker Medical Library model. Uh, also, just as a side mention, the Periodic Table of Scientometric Indicators, which is just really fun as inspiration for the sheer breadth of metrics that might be available. Um, and I really think what, what I want you to get from this primarily is to embrace the diversity of what impact might look like in your context and understand that what might illustrate impact for you could be very different from what in, from what illustrates impact for another researcher. And that's okay. It's not going to look the same for all of us. And that's appropriate. So here's a snapshot from the metrics toolkit um, showing you kind of a, some of the metrics that they include information on. If you click on one of these, like here's a snapshot of blog mentions. If we click on blog mentions, this is gonna show me details about what kinds of work might this metric apply to? How is this defined? What sorts of data sources are available where I could actually find data on this metric? Uh, what, kind, what are some of the limitations I should know about or some inappropriate use cases? So this is really helpful to help you wrap your brain around what a particular metric is and when it might be appropriate for you to use it. Uh, this is chapter five of Snowball Metrics. Um, there's a lot of information in Snowball Metrics that is more about research assessment that may be beyond what you need as an individual researcher. But this chapter five in particular on output and outcome metrics, again, suggests possible metrics, explains what they are, how they work, and what some of the primary sources are for finding that data. Now, a lot of this um, is written within the UK context. So some of the examples and things that they give are gonna be a little bit UK skewed, but there is also some US context given in here as well. Um, and I think it can still help to give us uh, just a better feeling for what these metrics can do. Uh, these are some screenshots from the Becker Medical Library model. Um, this is the one that I probably employed the most in my role when I'm helping researchers on our campus to tell the story of their research. Um, so they have several different areas of possible impact. And within each area, they suggest indicators and then tell you a little bit more about what those indicators would mean. So research outputs and activities. This is more just detailing what you do. What kinds of outputs are you creating? Showing that you are doing a lot of activities and putting out a lot of outputs. Um, then we look at the advancement of knowledge. There's some indicators in here about um, things like curriculum guidelines, sharing research data, uh, publishing your findings in gray literature, things like that. Legislation and policy. Um, this looks at what kinds of outcomes there might be in terms of policy citing your work or policy being changed to align to your work, um, providing expert witness testimony, things like that. Economic benefits. So your work results in cost savings, cost effectiveness, uh, disease prevention, quantity and quality of life, things like that. And then clinical implementation. So remembering that the Becker model is created within the context of a medical library. It includes clinical implementation as a critical area of medical research. Even though not all of us research in medicine, I find that this area is still really useful to think about um, practice, to think about practical application of our work. So they look at how uh, these indicators look at how your work has um, influenced clinically effective practice, coding, disease prevention, uh, diagnostic techniques. But in other fields, in other areas of practice, we can think of similar types of indicators that would show how our work is being applied in that actual practitioner context. And then here, just in a larger version for you, is that periodic table of scientometric indicators. It's a little short on detail, but again, I like it as just a visual inspiration to say, 
don't let me get stuck on one thing like the impact factor. Let me remember that there are so many possibilities that may be more appropriate in different contexts. All right, so boiling all this down and bringing this together, telling your story. When we wanna talk about the impact of our research, you wanna start with you as a researcher, start with your story. What are your values? What are your goals, your research agenda? Who are your target beneficiaries? Be able to explain that. Um, what sorts of values does your discipline have? Like as a field, what do they value and prioritize? Does your discipline have any sorts of priority research areas, research roadmaps, things like that? Then when we have that narrative of ourselves and our research story, we can add metrics and indicators that enhance that story, okay? We wanna add in things that show progress towards our goals and research agenda, show how our work aligns with our personal researcher values and our disciplinary values, um, provide metrics that show our success in reaching our target beneficiaries. We can also consider including data visualizations. I don't, I don't think this is considered often enough that sometimes instead of just giving some numbers, we might show a graph of something, but also we might show something like a map. Visualize the geographical spread of your work and how broad your influence has been geographically. Um, show some kind of a collaboration network map about all the different types of researchers that you've worked with, a citation network map showing how your work ties in with other experts in terms of um, cross-referencing, cross cross-citation. And then another thing we can think about integrating is meaningful anecdotes. Now, what do I mean by this? You could say that your work was tweeted 300 times. That's not that meaningful. Or you can tell me an anecdote about how your work was shared on Twitter by the president of this scholarly society or this organization who has 500,000 followers and they shared a link to your work with a substantive comment about how groundbreaking your work was. That one anecdote about who shared your work, what they said about it, and what that reach is, that may be way more meaningful than just saying 300 tweets. Ultimately, as we're putting this together, you gotta kind of know your field. This can be difficult in the beginning. You've gotta understand what other researchers in your discipline care about. Some metrics are gonna mean a lot more and a lot less. So I often use Twitter as an example here. Some fields may talk a lot on social media channels like Twitter or X as it's called now. Some fields could care less about that social media channel. So you've got to kind of know whether that is meaningful at all in your field. So don't waste your time just exhaustively cataloging all the possible stuff you could collect if it doesn't make sense for your work, if your field doesn't really value it. All right, let's look at just a couple of examples of how you can communicate some of these metrics. So uh, this first example is from a proposal. And the first few sentences, they kind of talk about um, the project. And then it says here in the mid round about the middle, it says, this article has attracted lots of attention since its publication. It was the object of a news and views in nature. It has been viewed more than 6,300 times since its publication two months ago, uh, widely discussed in social media. So they've put in a few numbers. They put the numbers in context. Um, now, I, as someone not in this field, maybe I don't know what news and views in nature is, but probably somebody else in their field would and would say, oh, I know that's you know fairly prestigious to get your work featured there or something like that. So we wanna try and pick and choose a few key things that will sound meaningful rather than just trying to throw every single possible number in here. Um, you can see here, I like this. He explains that it has an altmetric score of 151. That by itself is not meaningful. Then he explains, which makes it scoring higher than 99% of its contemporaries and includes it in the top five of all articles tracked by altmetric. So 
put it into context that a reader can understand. And then again, at the end, he mentions that it's received substantial attention by newspapers, magazines, et cetera. Uh, this example is from a CV. Um, you can see just it's the citation of a work and then just a few very brief bullet points that um, show the number of researchers in the collaboration, this you know ranked in the top 10 most read papers, et cetera. Just a few very quick hits that show some indicator of impact. And then these, um, these last two examples are both from tenure and promotion portfolios. And again, this one, really simple. The citation, a link, and then the number of views that it's had on SlideShare, some form of engagement of people viewing the slides for this presentation. And this last one showing several citations with the number of article views and the number of views that the supplemental data that was shared received. Some um, quick statistics like the number one most downloaded article in the journal for January through March of 2012. Very, very quick and simple. Not a lot of effort put into those little bullet points, but possibly a lot of meaning extracted from them. So I'm not necessarily endorsing these as the best examples or models to follow, just giving you an idea of how others have communicated some of this data. Couple of caveats. As I've said several times, metrics are contextual. Do not try to compare across disciplines with a metric like journal impact factor, a citation count, H index, et cetera. And some cannot even be compared between early and late career researchers. Understand and respect the metrics intention and avoid unintended uses. Just as an example, impact factor is intended to describe a journal. It should not be used as a proxy to describe an individual article or researcher. I strongly recommend going out and reading the San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment and the Leiden Manifesto. They're very short documents, doesn't take a lot of time, but they really boil down some of the key principles for the responsible use of research metrics. Ultimately, research impact is complex. Do not trust any attempts to reduce all of this to one single score, because that's not going to tell the whole story. And I love this quote that, unfortunately, there is not a simple formula to measure, reach, influence, mobilization. Um, the journey to impact is far more heterogeneous than something measured by an impact factor. We need a much more nuanced and sophisticated approach using quantitative and qualitative measures um, combined with storytelling, narratives, and this just can't be done in a number. So. Finishing up here with links to a few key resources. Um, these are some of the primary tools you can use for finding journal level metrics. I think these can be particularly helpful before publication when you're deciding where you may want to submit your work, being able to look at um, different journal level characteristics. These are some of the tools for article level metrics where you can find a particular article's um, citations and other types of altmetric engagement. And then some tools for other miscellaneous kinds of metrics here, including uh, a link to WorldCat and the Open Syllabus Project. There can be lots of other relevant tools depending on what supports your story. These are just some of the core uh, opportunities. And then I've included a link to our, re our library's guide on research impact. The last note I'll close on here is reminding you or making you aware that the library can support you in this endeavor. So I, as the scholarly communications librarian, can help you to identify potentially appropriate metrics for your work, understand and explain what a particular metric conveys and does not. I can help you learn to use some of these key resources for finding metrics, but I can also do the legwork to compile metrics for your work. And I can help to draft a research impact narrative that puts some of those metrics into context. And then generally just discuss any other related topics and answer questions for you in this area. So with that, I'm going to wrap up this recording and say thank you. If you have questions, please do feel free to reach out to me at any time um, by, the by the methods on the screen. And the slides that link to the research impact guide, um, I also have an appointment scheduling button there in the research guide for you. So I look forward to assisting you with this at any time. Have a great rest of your day.